This is episode 43 of the Home and Family Culture Podcast, and I'm Jody Chafee. In this episode, I interviewed Morgan Reynolds of Miss Mo Storytelling. Welcome to the Home and Family Culture Podcast, where I discuss how families can discover and design their collective vision, values, beliefs, and traditions that influence their family culture. In this podcast, I interview experts who offer tips and tools to inspire families in this process of developing their family culture, and also successful individuals whose success was influenced by their family culture growing up. Be sure to check out the show notes for this and every episode at homeandfamilyculture.com, where you can subscribe for my weekly newsletter filled with updates on the podcast and blog, as well as other tidbits of information I like to add. You can listen to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, or YouTube. Please subscribe to your favorite medium. You can also find me on social media at Family Culture Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and Pinterest, and at underscore Family Culture on Twitter. Be sure to comment, follow, like, rate, and share. But enough about all that. Let's get to the episode. Thank you for listening. Morgan Reynolds has been telling stories for most of her life. She remembers tying on a bandana and lying upside down with magic marker eyes painted on her chin to perform Wide Mouth Frog for her friends. It was a huge hit. When her oldest, now 14, was a toddler, he had an endless appetite for stories. He would give her three animals and a place, and she had to create a story off the top of her head. Eventually, she had to create story tickets, that he would use to buy a story. There had to be some rationing. That grew to telling at family reunions, and soon after, Miss Mo was born. Morgan started performing on stage when she was 12 years old and dreamed of being a professional actress. That is a difficult dream to realize, especially with three kids. Storytelling came to her as a way to perform on her time with total control over the, the content. She just started telling stories without realizing that there is a storytelling world out there. Now she has performed at festivals, attends workshops, and teaches storytelling to others. Some of the most powerful storytelling occurs in the unplanned moments. The experiences around the dinner table that start with, did I ever tell you about the time when I was a kid that I? That's when you got them. Kids love to hear stories, especially about the grown-ups in their lives and especially if it involves the grown-ups in their lives getting into some trouble. Those stories, told honestly, have far more power than any sermon we could ever attend. Morgan is using modern technology to spread the art of storytelling. She has a YouTube channel with playlists of stories geared towards school-aged kids. She is also on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. Living in rural Montana makes traveling to live performances difficult, but she has high hopes of building her online brand and connecting with children and adults all over the world through the power of story. Here we go with Miss Mo. We <laughs> Welcome, go. Morgan. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. Thanks, Jody. You did great. That was Thanks. awesome. <laughs> Very conversational. Good, good. <laughs> And I love it. Like I said, I love that it's a story, that it's your story, and that I got to introduce you by telling your story. That's oh, awesome. thanks. I didn't even think of it. Maybe it's just sort of a natural now. I just, everything's I, a story. A, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Not all stories start with once upon a time. Right. And learning, right. Right. That's, uh, well, they start with, did I ever tell you? Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> or sitting there and going, hmm, when yep. I was your age. Or <laughs> yep. That reminds me, that's a big... When I, I just went to a storytelling festival in Florida, and um, that was one of the things people talked about is so many stories start with, oh, that reminds me. And then it goes into another story of that's awesome. something, a folk so, tale or a personal. So there's a whole festival about storytelling. There are many. Yeah. So storytelling is, so I just sort of taught myself about storytelling <clears throat> and didn't really know that it was something that other people did. I just kind of did it with my kids and, and then I did it family reunions and, and so forth and so on. And I just kind of taught myself about to tell stories. And so I didn't know that there was this other world out there. And then I discovered it. There's a, in Jonesboro, Tennessee, which isn't too far from you, you should take a road trip is the international storytelling center. And it's in this tiny town and it's just dedicated to the art of storytelling. 
and a lot of people think of it, it's pretty, you know, there are lots of Appalachian story ta- stories and it's a real oral tradition is a big part in the, mm. in the rural part of the country and especially in the South. And so I went there and I remember I saw Laura Sims, who's a great storyteller. If you looked up her, S-I-M-M-S, she's great. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I saw her. And so I remember feeling scared because I thought, um, what if I'm not a storyteller? Like, what if I watch her and I realize, oh, I'm not even a storyteller. So it was wonderful when I saw her perform and I realized, oh yeah, that's what I do. Like I have things to learn, but I'm a storyteller. Oh, that's cool. And that's when I started to um, learn more about the world that's out there. So if you, I would venture to say in almost every state, um, there is a storytelling festival somewhere in your state. Interesting. Um, the big ones are in Jonesboro, Tennessee, there's the National Storytelling Festival and it's in October. Um, and then there's another big one in Utah, the Mountain Timpanoga Storytelling Festival. That's a big one. Um, and it's in September. But I just went and performed at the Florida Storytelling Festival, which is in Mount Dora, Florida, and there, anyway, there are small storytelling festivals. Some of them are just a day, like in a local library. There's, um, I'm going to a storytelling festival in Rexburg in the middle of August. So yeah, there, if you just use the almighty Google um, and, and look up storytelling festivals, you can find one in your state. And there are some, there are a few big names like Bill Lepp and Kim Whitecamp and Sam Payne, some names that I'm learning now um, that, that are national tellers where they traveled all over the country and tell, but there are really wonderful regional tellers that tell at these festivals. And, and they're not like the Mount Timpanoga storytelling festival. They have one tent that's for kids, but the other tents, they're actually kids aren't allowed. It's like eight and up. And so it's really geared towards adults, mostly personal narratives. Sometimes like my style is kind of personal narratives blended with folk tales, but it, it is, it's a, it's the a renaissance right now of storytelling and it's it's all over and and like the moth on NPR and that's a storytelling venue okay. and they have story slams and competitions in big cities and so yeah there's this network that's becoming less and less underground and more and more mainstream but it's still a lot of people are like for instance i have a show in washington coming up and they're like do you need a chair for you to read the book and i'm like no, I don't read. I, it's a it's a performance, but they yeah. they just think I'm reading a book. So storytelling is still people are still like, what is storytelling? What is it? What do you even do at a festival? So you should everyone should try and find a storytelling festival because it's a it's a really it's such a positive. Storytellers are happy. People that like to listen to storytellers are happy. Like it's just a real positive network of people sharing stories about their families and from their family history and, and folk tales from their culture, from their religions, from, and it's just all about like positive connection. That's what storytelling is. It's the art of connecting through oral tradition. That's why it's been around for thousands and thousands of years. So yeah. Um, yeah. So it's everywhere. That's fascinating. I love hearing that and learning about it because that's something I had no idea that it was this huge international uh, I mean, the way, way, as you talk about it, it makes sense, you know, that there is this this tradition of oral, you know, language mm-hmm. and tradition of telling the stories of your ancestors and things. But that that's really awesome. That's inspiring. It's a real um, transformative art, and it it tra- and and transports the audience. Like mm-hmm. it's one of my favorite moments of storytelling is when I'm especially to <clears throat> young people like middle schoolers is my favorite audience probably because I'll tell a story and I can just see it sort of land. I can see them thinking almost like it's, I can almost see a sign across their forehead saying, I've never thought of that before. (laughs) And it's such a powerful moment because they're there. And in the beginning, they're just there because it's this really interesting story or it's funny. And then all of a sudden in the middle of this narrative, they're like, whoa, that's, I didn't see that coming, but it's, there's this great story that's told a fable and it's, uh, it's this old lady who lives above this village and she looks down, always going down into this village. And she has so many things that she wants to share with the people of this village, but they won't let her in and they push her away and they close their doors and they cross the street to avoid her. And, and she just keeps going every day because she wants to share wisdom with her, with them. And she wants to be their friend and they just keep rejecting her. And one day she lives she was looking down from her home and she lived kind of above this village where she could see what was going on. And as she was looking down, she saw this man come into the village and he had this 
big curly mustache and this hat with a plume and this cape and was riding this black stallion. And he was very exciting to look at. And he came into the town and everyone just swarmed him and they welcomed them him into their home. And the women just swooned and they offered him food and shelter and they listened to everything he said. And, and she would watch him every day and wonder, yeah, why are they letting him in and not me? And so one day as he was riding out of town, she went down and And she stood in front of his horse and she stopped him and she said, who are you and why do they love you and they won't love me? I have so many things I want to give them too. And he looked down at her and he said, who are you? And she said, I am truth. Who are you? And he said, I am story. And he bent over and he picked her up and he put her her on the horse behind him and wrapped her in his cape. And he said, from now on, we'll travel together and they will let us both in. And from then on, truth always traveled with story. And then they were able to go into people's homes together. And I think that's such a great fable of whether a story is a folk tale or it's a story from your family, there's truth that can be taught only when it's writing with story in a way that's really both entertaining and enlightening. And, um, and that's Powerful. the power of storytelling. Yeah. yeah, just that story you just told was very powerful. I get chills as you know they're thinking about this that that concept like you said it was like oh I didn't see that coming <laughs> that's so that's a good that's a good story well and, and I've had on on just just I just want to mention this I had on the podcast uh, Marlene Peterson is her name and her stories are incredible like the way that she talks about I mean she's she's mostly just reading the stories but the way she tells them is still really moving. <laughs> and, but that's, um, she wrote a whole book about, it was called, it's called storytelling. When you can touch somebody's heart, that makes it so much easier to reach their minds. Mm-hmm. And, and heart education is something that is so lacking in our culture and our society in general, you know, to, to teach our hearts and teach, basically that means like, soft skills, but it also is more than that because it's like a spiritual thing even mm-hmm. to, to be able to be sensitive to the intuition of your heart is basically where that, where that, the, the message that she's trying to convey. And so I like that, that whole concept that the power of stories to inspire and, you know, enrich our hearts and then by default our you know, by connection, our, our minds. Mm-hmm. It's very powerful. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Stories are very powerful, a wonderful way to learn and teach and about yourself and it builds confidence. And, and anyway, there, there's so many benefits of stories. And so what are some of the benefits of stories and storytelling? Well, I think, um, on the practical side, learning to tell stories is excellent for, for your brain and for health and, and memorizing. I know I was in a play. Mm -hmm. I I had the opportunity to not a, it wasn't a blessing per se, but we, I, there was a play in our little town and um, one of the ladies in the play a week before the show was going to open suddenly passed away from Mm -hmm. a stroke or they don't know what. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted the play to go on. Her family wanted the play to go on and they needed someone to fill in. So they came and asked me if I would, step in her part, <clears throat> which was a pretty major part in this musical. And so I had a week to learn all the songs and all of her lines. And, and I was able to learn it. And a lot of people were like, how do you learn that so fast? And I said, well, my memorizing muscles are doing sit-ups all day long because okay. <laughs> I'm, I make a diagram about it and I write notes about it. And then I have to repeat it you know, and then I'll repeat it like three times to when I'm telling to maybe a few different classes in the same day. And so learning stories is so good for your memory and it's it's a really fun way to practice memorizing things because it doesn't need to be word for word you're basically just memorizing kind of the general order uh-huh. yeah which is another great benefit for kids it's um it's so important i think for kids to hear stories not just because of the deeper blessings of mm-hmm. um the emotional blessings of it yeah. but also it helps a child understand sequencing of sequencing mm-hmm. of events what happened and when, and then asking questions and then recall those sequencing. And if if children can learn to tell stories, then it builds their confidence and it builds their capacity to communicate and um, to memorize and to learn and then to, to recite. Um, Or even if it's not 
a recitation. You're just kind of retelling it in their own words. That's just a lot of synthesizing that happens yeah. in the brain to learn a story, then to tell it, then to change it, then to then to get feedback on it. And a, lot, a few of the festivals I've been to, they have youth storytellers. And their stories are very memorized and scripted because that's where the, the stage where they are. Um, but then as they get older, they get more confident sort of telling it off the cuff and or tweaking it as they go. And, and in storytelling, it's very much you pay attention to the audience and, and you might have to change the ebb or flow of the story or the pacing mm -hmm. depending on how the audience is responding. So there are just a lot of positive things that come from it, from learning how to tell a story and from listening to a story not beyond just the the most obvious and probably lasting benefit, which is just the lessons you learn from the story experience. But it's also just a really great skill building. Yeah. To, to learn to listen to stories and the way that stories like the sequence and how there's always like a, you know, beginning, middle and ends, climax, conflict, things like that, that builds it builds character and, and resilience to see the way that conflicts re rise and resolve right like doesn't that isn't that another part of just this the the impact of stories in and of themselves yeah i think so you know when kids i've taught talk to kids are what are the elements of a good story and they're mm -hmm. always characters and plot and setting but there's always a conflict and there's always yeah. a resolution in a good story and sometimes you know i tell a story about a troll with no heart um, and it's a long story, so I won't go into it here, but at the end of the story, there's a moment where the, the young prince has the troll's heart in his hand, and he's squeezing it to get the troll to turn his brothers back into humans and to release the princess, and, and he's squeezing it and squeezing it, and then I stop and say, what would you do? Like, he has the troll's heart. What do you think he does next, and what would you do? And I get lots of different answers, and you know, some kids are like, throw it down and stomp it. And other kids are like, you know, squeeze it, kill him. But always, every time I've told this story, someone in the audience says, put it back in the troll. And that's exactly what the young man does. He goes and he gives the troll back his heart and that changes everything. And so I think that teaching them the elements of a story that there's always a conflict and there's always a resolution. And sometimes you open that resolution up to them yeah. to end it as they want to. And not every story is serious. Bill Lepp is an example. He's a great storyteller and all of his are funny and they're just like whoppers. And, but humor can teach a lot too. It's just yeah. fun to just laugh together. Laugh with other humans is a powerful experience. So they're not always like super deep, but, right. but just, it's, but it's still, even then, even in funny stories, there has to be a conflict or else it's a joke, not a story. Right. Right. So there, there has to be a beginning, there has to be progress, and then there's a conflict, and then there's some sort of resolution of that conflict. And so, yeah, you're teaching writing skills and just so much as they, as they listen to these stories. And there has to be tension in a mm -hmm. story as well, which is a, a good lesson. Yeah, that's cool. I like that you're, you know, you're, you're helping the kids to, like you said, writing Mm -hmm. Sometimes people like we tell our kids to go write something, but then they're like, well, write what? <laughs> right. So it's, it's, yeah. Giving them things to, to, to write and to tell stories about. I love that. Mm -hmm. So let's go into a little bit more about what is family culture to you? That's an interesting thing. And I've been thinking about it. Um, so the words that come to my mind when I think about family culture, I think of um, traditions and customs of that have you know either um regional or or faith-based customs and yeah. values um ethnic traditions like you know just sort of the things that are that are part of your family culture you know that that you do every christmas or that you always do on easter or that you always do here this is you know these yeah. are the traditions my sister Mar my oldest sister Marcy was the keeper of the traditions. She was the Tevya of our family, you know, the traditions. And it was like, <laughs> no, this is what we do every time, every Sunday or every Christmas. Like, this is it. I don't think that's all of what family culture is. It all feeds into this, this sense of your family. And so I was asking my son, well, what do you think our family culture is? His first answer was skiing because <laughs> we just moved to Montana and uh, learned to ski. And I'm like, I, I think we go a little deeper than that. I was like, <laughs> but, like, what do you think Reynolds is are known for? Like, you know, what do you think people are like, oh, the Reynolds family. And he said music, which really surprised me because singing in front of people is he'd rather have toothpicks under his fingernails, but he loves to play the guitar 
and and my daughter Lucy played in piano in a in a fifth grade talent show today, and I love to sing. And but I would have never thought that he would have nailed that as our culture, as our thing. When he was three or four, we'd always say to him, and he caught on. He would always say over and over, and something was hard. We'd say, "Hey, Reynolds has never quit," and that became now our whole extended family. Reynolds has never quit. That's so. I think that's a part of our of culture and. Yeah. And just sort of what you value and what you do on a day-to-day basis. And, and I think for that connect that to storytelling, those values, those traditions, those custom customs, those sayings, right? Those habits, those talents, those all get passed down through stories. You know, even music, you sing the songs and you pass them, you know, my mm-hmm. kids are listening to songs that my father-in-law sang to his son who is there, you know, and, and so we just, we pass these songs down, we pass the stories down, we, we come down in our pajamas, you know, we get new pajamas on Christmas Eve, because I tell my kids how that's what I got when I was a kid, you know, so culture is passed down through stories, not sit down, let me tell you a story, story, right. but hey, when I was a kid, we got new pajamas on Christmas Eve, so there's a story, you know, that's a story, beginning and end. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, um, but that's how those culture things get passed down and build, you know, positive or negative, build up the the sense and of what matters in a family. Mm, yeah. No, I, I love that. I love everything you just said. That I completely agree with you. I think that's one of the things I love about this podcast and talking to different people is these amazing perspectives about what family culture is. Mm. And and I love that you brought up this, you know, what you're known for and and how, you know, that the things that you perpetuate are through the stories that you tell and and the traditions that you keep up and the habits that you have. And, and I just did an interview about uh, culture through the generations, basically, where she talked about it being uh, a, something that is woven into the fabric of your family that mm-hmm. is passed down you know, through, through the generations and things. And I thought that was a really beautiful way of, of putting it. And, and a lot of people have said, you know, that the stories are your family culture, mm-hmm. you know, and, and when you can tell a story, especially of uh, your ancestors or grandparents or even your childhood, that it instills in your children their sense of identity, that this is, these are the, these are the stories that belong to me because they're my family. Mm-hmm. And then it gives them a sense of being a part of something bigger than themselves. Yeah. I think that's huge that it gives people a sense of being part of something bigger. That's, you know, I tell the stories that my mom tells me about my grandmother and my great grandmother, my great great grandmother, who were these incredibly strong women in Oklahoma, homesteaders and, and just phenomenally strong, tough women who had to deal with, you know, depression and when and the Dust Bowl and husbands breaking backs and tuberculosis. Like, these incredible stories and multiple times through my life, I have felt that I could do difficult things because they were in me, their blood. And I remember when um, I was having, I can't remember which child it was, but that my husband, you know, said a special prayer for me. And as he spoke, he said, remember the women, your mother and your grandmother and your great grandmother, these women are in you. Mm-hmm. And they're a part of you, and that will give you strength. And it has throughout so many times when I've thought I had something in front of me that I didn't think I could do. I would remember my great grandmother who went back to nursing school to nurse her husband through tuberculosis and raised her 12 brothers and sisters. And I would think, I can do this because they did that. That is powerful for our children to hear, not just about us, but about these people that they have the DNA, they have the same genetic code of people who have done really difficult things. And so that can give them so much power and it gives me power. And yeah, they're, it, it connects them to this web of people who have risen above challenges. And it's so important that they hear those stories, that yeah. we hear those stories. Totally. There's even the stu- these studies that have proven that kids who, who know about like the answers to questions about their families, mm-hmm. that they, they, have, they have a more unifying narrative about where they come from. And then that gives them that resilience. They're, they're more 
resilient. They can cope with mm-hmm. challenges and struggles better mm-hmm. because they know the answers to the questions like where your parents grew up, where your grandparents grew mm-hmm. up, where, you know, and, and there's, how can you convey those things except by telling stories? Right. And right. there was another part of, of the, this study that I thought was really interesting. So it, it, there was a study of, in the military that by teaching new recruits about the history of their service, increased their camaraderie and their ability to bond more closely with their unit. And so when they, they knew that family history, that, that, was, that was part of this narrative of we are part of something. Yeah. And so it was, it's very empowering. It's very, you know, it's, it's strengthening. It's <laughs> That's interesting because my husband worked at VMI, Virginia mm-hmm. Military Institute for a while. He's a, he was a part-time therapist there. And one of the things their freshman year, they're called rats and they do horrible things, but one <laughs> to just the phasing. But one of the things they do is they have this little white book um, that they have to carry with them and they basically have to memorize it. And it, it's the history of VMI. And so uh-huh. it's like, how many steps are in the bleachers and who was the first cadet that did this and who's Stonewall Jackson and all of these things. And it, and when you said that, that brought to my mind that maybe it's not totally arbitrary, but they are trying to connect them yeah. to the history and, and the VMI and a lot of these military academies, the alumni are like they're just such a powerful group because they're so connected both because of maybe the trauma they had to endure (laughs) that first year, but also they know the stories together. They know the stories of the cadets who did this and this and this, they know how many steps there are in the bleachers. They know the first year it was founded. They know the football game records for the last 15 years, you know, they know the stories. And so they feel like they're a part of this greatness, you know, um, and that's why I think there's such a huge bond at some of those military academies, which I'd never thought of before. Of yeah. that, that, and I, and so much of that is just an innate thing. I don't think they read a study. They were like, no, we yeah. just want them to know the history. We want them to know the story. And well, you think of anything that people are loyal to is because they have a history there, right? you know? And yeah. so, you know, it, it creates that loyalty that is uh you know undying and so that's what we need more of in our culture and our society i think you know i mean yeah. within you know our faith we're encouraged to do family history work you know genealogy to connect our lines and things like that and i think some people are like oh this is so boring or you know they feel like it's kind of a chore or tedious but actually there's there's so much more to it mm-hmm. than just finding names and connecting people, which is already, it is powerful, it, yeah. you know, but there's even more to it because I hear stories of people, oh, I've already done all my family history. I know all, you know, who's in my lines back to, mm-hmm. back to Adam, some, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. And, and so they're like, there's nothing else to do. Well, but do you know this, their stories? The stories, find the stories. Who and they are. And not just the gra- great, great grandma and great, great grandpa stories, but your stories and, and your children's stories and the stories that happened last year, you know, like yeah. it's not just the stories from a century ago. It's, do you guys remember what happened last Christmas or do you guys remember when you were four? I mean, my kids love to read their old journals and they love to read that I kept for them and they love to look through the family picture books and they love, because it's stories, it's all just stories and they love reading their birthing stories. You know, they love to, and they'll just sit and even my teenager will just sit and flip through them because and that's family his that's doing family history as much as microfishing you know is right. is writing down your children's stories and and talking about your stories that's that's family history as well and it's sometimes it's hard to remember so so what do you do to to capture those stories i mean it, you've made it a practice but for us laymen who <laughs> don't know how to make it a practice like what do you do in order to to capture those stories? Well, I'm a journal person. I have stacks and stacks of journals. And and so journaling is huge. They make so many. I, I just bought this new journal. It's the five-year journal. Have you heard of these? Yeah. They're yes. great. And mine, I ordered on Amazon. I have a really hard time remembering to like pre- measure out stuff when I buy things on Amazon because <laughs> it's a lot smaller than I thought it was going to be. Uh-huh. So I might order a different one. But, <laughs> but I love the idea of of having five years of history. And so just jotting down, I just say it, do it at night just quickly uh-huh. um, before I go to bed. 
and jot down like funny things that happened. And, and it's just like a tiny, it's like three lines, you know? So journals, I'm a huge proponent of journals, keeping a journal. But some of the other things that, that I've done, well, I use chat books. That's a great for me with, I don't know if you know oh, what those okay. are. Yeah. So I take pictures on my phone and then so week. once a week I'll go and I put all the pictures into a chat books and then I just write a little caption under each one. Um, and that's, so that's a story. So how, you know, however you use your pictures and you caption your pictures, whether it's on a blog or chat books or Instagram, I know a lot of people use Facebook and Instagram as their albums. Yeah. So, um, I don't like to do that as much cause I don't know. I don't, I don't think people are that interested in my life. And so <laughs> I just kind of, I personally, I just put them on chat books and, and I use other things for the Facebook and Instagram, but mm-hmm. any, however you record your pictures and memories about those pictures, there, there's so many other great journals for me. Journaling comes naturally because I've done it since I was little. Um, but if you're just building that habit, there are great journals that are, yeah, mother daughter journals where you, and mother son and father son and so on and so forth, where it has prompts and you write in the journal and then the daughter writes back. And we do that with our kids just with a notebook, especially they do this with my husband. I don't know why they don't do it with me as much. I think because naturally kids talk more easily to their mothers sometimes. So my husband is great about, he has a notebook and he'll, my daughter will write a letter and put it, the notebook on his pillow and then he'll write back and put it on her pillow. Oh, that's cool. and, and so it's not really collecting stories, but it is these conversations. And sometimes yeah. kids are willing to write questions um, that they aren't as willing to speak. And, but then we keep those. So they are a, a collection of stories. And then, yeah, I mean, technology makes it really easy where you can, if a kid says something funny and they even have journals I've seen that are like kid quotes. So you can buy a journal that's just like funny things your kids say. So I would look into those, those journals that give you a prompt and it's like a story a day, you know, and it'll ask you a prompt every day to, cause the blank page can be a scary thing. Right. Um, and so finding journals that give you prompts and that connect you, there's so many products that people have created out there. So as far as collecting family stories, that's how, that's how I do it. Um, of, of, and write down my kids' stories and things that have happened and, and keeping my own journal and things like that. And there are more organized ways to do it, but I think you just kind of start doing and you figure out what works for you. I think that's the key is figuring out what works for you because if you make it too complicated or something that's just overwhelming, you're going to do it once and give up. Right. <laughs> and so it's, it's, you know, like there was always this like big, uh, like scrapbooking craze or something. Yeah. But that's so time consuming it's and so time expensive. I've never done that. Yeah. And so it's just, I. Am but it's great of, for some people, and that's a part of their right. story. And that that's brings true. them joy. That's true. And so I think that you have, yeah, you, you've got to realize that just like every story is unique, every way of capturing a story is unique. And what works for you is what works for you. And that's your yeah. story. Yeah. And that's how it works, you know. And some people do, you know, a picture a day or a second a day. I have a friend that does that. He just films like one second a day and you, oh, uh-huh. you know? and, and that's great for me. I'm a word person. That's how I process. And so that works for me. So you find ways to connect or to collect your stories visually or physically or however it works for you. You know, as you're telling that, it's like everybody has a family culture, whether they know it or not. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's like, if, if you find something that works for you and that is your family culture, yeah. You know, that that is a part of who you are that's part of what you do. But then another the other aspect of that is that you do need to be intentional. You know, you can't uh you know what I mean? You can't just coast and then expect you're going to just remember this stuff. It's you so got to you have to be intentional and you have to set aside time that does work for you. Yeah. In order to That's a great point. Memories. That you don't need to do it in a way that someone else does, but you do have to do it. Yeah. And, and that's never, and I look back and I read things that I wrote in my kids' journals. And I know that at the moment when it happened, I was certain I would never have forgotten that. But it's like, what a happy surprise. I had totally forgotten about that. (laughs) And yeah, you do have to make time and not a lot of time. We're blessed to live in an age where it's never been easier to gather stories from ourselves, from our family members. Um, There are apps for it. There are so many things for it, but you just have to do something, you know, and it changes. It's, you know, mine is my method of gathering and remembering changes and my schedule. I, when I was home full time, I had a lot more time to write journals and things. And 
working full time has limited that a lot. And I'm grateful for technology because it's made it possible for me to still have some memories collected, even when I'm really, really busy. Yeah. I like the idea of doing the chat books. I like that, you know, uh, there's electronic journals, I'm sure, and things like that. Mm -hmm. I like lately I've been doing, um, they, you know, with a, with this smartphone, or at least with the Apple device, they have the garage band on, on there. Mm. And I've, I haven't told stories on there yet, but uh, my kids and I, they love, because I have this studio and stuff, they like to be recorded. Yeah. You know, and so it's it's so fun. And like, my kids are really into singing along to songs and stuff like that. And so (laughs) we'll just like, oh man, my three-year-old, I'll have to share this because my three-year-old will sing all of the songs from The Greatest Showman like nobody (laughs) Would you did you prepare a sh- uh, one of your favorite short stories that reflects? I mean, you 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 told that one about truth mm-hmm. that story that I really liked. Is there another story that that you'd like to share? I think probably the story I told you about truth and um, would be the one that I think would be the most that would that story to me is really about the importance of family stories. So, a story that came to my mind to tell was um, when I was in labor with my youngest daughter Emma. I was doing it naturally and which feels wonderful, of course. <laughs> and I was okay. exhausted, been lots of hours and and the pushing just wasn't happening and she wasn't it wasn't progressing. And the nurse kept saying to me, The baby isn't happy, the baby is happy. And I kept saying, Stop saying that. Do I look happy? Okay. <laughs> I'm not happy. Stop saying that. And my husband's like, Morgan, you just got to push. And I remember grabbing his shirt and he claims it was a punch, but I believe it was more just, I pulled him towards me forcefully and then pushed him away quickly (laughs) with my fist. And I said, stop, I'm doing the best I can. And I felt like no one in the room could understand how hard I was trying and I was giving everything I had. But what I couldn't see was that she was in trouble, that her heart rate was dropping. And they could see that and they didn't know how to tell me. My husband later told me that he didn't know if it would help things or if I would panic. And because at that point I was just like, please just like cut me open something. I just can't, I can't take this anymore. I was so tired and in so much pain. But um, anyway, so her heart rate dropped and and then it flatlined. And, and so her heart stopped and I wasn't aware of this, but um, so they brought in, I guess, like the heavy hitter nurse that could <laughs> that could really make things happen. And my husband saw the monitor go flat, and then the nurse came in, and she put her hand on my knee, and she looked me in the eyes, and she said, "Morgan, this baby needs out now." And in that moment, it, the whole world sort of paused and clicked, and I realized that my baby was in danger. And that I was the only one who could save her and that no one could do it but me. And so in that moment, then I had what I needed to have. And I dug down deep in one push and I brought her out and she had umbilical cord wrapped several times around her neck. So pushing was not working because she would come and go and the cord was pulling her back up. And so she was born and and they unwrapped her and it took a while for her, you know, they had to slap her around a little bit and wake her up. And then she cried and everything was fine. And she's brilliant and wonderful. And it was great. But I look back at that moment and I thought often how that's a defining moment for me as a mother, that sometimes as humans, there are things that only we can do for ourselves and for other people. And that in that moment, I was the only one who could save her. And sometimes in our lives, we are in positions where we are the only ones who can save ourselves or do something for other people. Like we're the only ones that can do that. And, and I look back on that story and I've told Emma that story many times. She's heard it many times as I've told other people. And I hope that it reminds her how much I love her of what, what a treasure she was and how much we wanted her here safely. But I also tell it because it's a good reminder for me just of what I can do when, when I do. Um, of what and what I have to do sometimes that no one else can do in a way that no one else can do it. Mm. So, so to me, that's, you know, not like a happy folktale kind of story, but that's the first story that popped into my mind, I guess, of a story from my own nuclear family history Mm -hmm. that is 
been the most empowering to me and, and hopefully empowering to my children um, and especially my daughters as, as future mothers. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that, Morgan. Mm-hmm. So in conclusion, what are some books that illustrate the importance of stories or books that parents can use to help us with mindfulness, being present to stories, knowing when to record them, things like that? Well, the first story that comes to my mind, or the first book rather, it's um, a fairly new picture book. It's called Stolen Words. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's by Melanie Florence. Um, And it's this really beautiful book. And it's about a grandpa who was raised in a Native American reservation school back in the earlier days of it when they would force them to forget their native tongue and force them to speak English. And so his granddaughter asks him to teach her his language and he can't remember. So she goes to the library and finds a book of their language and teaches him. And then he starts to remember it's this, it's a gorgeous book. The illustrations are beautiful and it's a really powerful picture book. That's about the power of, um, of words and, and how words connect and not sto- not just stories, but the words that make the stories connect people. Their language connects people. So that's the first book that came to my mind that just teaches about that. Yeah. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I feel like it's the books I've already mentioned as far as going to the bookstore and finding those journal prompts, finding the books that are mom and me and dad and me and, you know, our family story and all of these books that give these really wonderful daily prompts, you know, 365 prompts and all of these things that'll, that really will just kind of hold your hand and give you ideas of where to start. Those are wonderful resources to start with. And there are so many of them and, you know, and things that you can, can find. Um, So really that picture book is the first one that came to mind. There is a collection, but it's a collection of folk tales. And so you can look up different folk tales and Mm -hmm. from around the world and things, but if you're looking at family history, I think just starting with a blank page is much more effective than world folk tales. That's great entertainment and it's great to read together, but Jane Yolen, that's who it is. Jane Yolen makes a really great collection of folk tales from around the world. But if, if it's family history, I think just starting with a blank page and some questions and giving it some time and, and being aware that sometimes, like we said in the beginning, the best moments are just around the dinner table or in the car, like, oh, that reminds me, or did I ever tell you, or, mm-hmm. you know, but then taking time to write those down. But those, the, I think that an empty book is perhaps the best book to start with. <laughs> awesome. So where can we find Miss Mo? Oh, well. Connect so, with you. Yeah, awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, my YouTube channel, it's, it's M-I-S-S-M-O, uh, Miss Mo Storyteller is my YouTube channel. Um, and it's divided up into playlists, playlists, Native American stories, stories from around the world and just different playlists. Um, so that's YouTube. And then on Facebook, same thing, Miss Mo Storyteller. Facebook and Instagram are the same thing, Miss Mo Storyteller, M-I-S-S-M-O Storyteller. And then I'm on Twitter, but I'm still learning how to use Twitter, but it's Miss Mo <laughs> Stories. Um, I'm more active on Facebook and Instagram. My website is um, MissMoStoryteller.com. So it's all kind of the same. Just look up Miss Mo. M-I-S-S-M-O. Um, I took for granted living in the South that every, when you never called what adults by their first names, you always yeah. called them like Miss Morgan or Mr. And so I just figured everyone would know how to spell Miss Mo. And living in Montana now, people are like, well, how do you spell it? I'm like, what do you mean? How do you spell it? It's <laughs> Miss Mo. And so I'm realizing that was a cultural mm-hmm. difference. So I have to spell it out now. It's M-I-S-S-M-O. Um, storyteller. So just look up Miss Mo Storyteller and I'm everywhere. And there you are. <laughs> awesome. Well, I look forward to hearing all of your stories and thank you. Seeing how your how this all progresses and plays out for you because yeah, it's I'm, awesome that there's so much you can do with with stories and there's so many ways to to promote the thing that you love nowadays. You know, yeah. to do what you love. So. It's very exciting, yeah, to see how, and I think using technology is the next step of, it's mm-hmm. it's our new campfire. You know, stories were, have been told around the campfire for, like I said, thousands of years, and now we have very different kinds of campfires, but we still have to keep telling those stories around the Instagram campfire and the Facebook campfire <laughs> of, of passing on these, not just family stories, but myths and legends, yeah. and, and because they all have truth wrapped up in their cape, and and how we spread those stories around to each other 
it just kind of builds the human connection. And it's so important, not just the two second Instagram stories, but the actual stories that we tell each other. So I'm excited to see where it goes and living in where we live. That's, that's sort of a necessity for me to perpetuate the art of storytelling, but it's also an exciting um, venture to be using social media and the modern technology to promote a very ancient art really. So I'm excited too. We'll see where it goes. So I really appreciate it. Thank you for being here on the podcast. Thank you, Jody. I'm happy to share your message. (laughs) Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Morgan. I loved everything about this episode and storytelling. And I'm super excited about all these storytelling festivals and storytellers. I mean, forget about comedians. (laughs) Just go check out these awesome storytellers and the stories that they tell and how inspiring and even funny these things can be. And just the way that stories are told are so inspiring. So go check those things out. You can see all those links on my show notes at homeandfamilyculture.com and you can get Morgan's links to connect with her and see all the work that she is doing. Thank you so much. If you'll do me a favor, go into your app that you're listening to. It's super easy with Apple Podcasts. You just scroll down to where you see the ratings and the reviews and you just click on that and you leave a rating and a review. And it would be so awesome to see your thoughts and allow other potential listeners to see how you like this podcast. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for following me on social media, especially on Instagram and Facebook. I really like being on those on those platforms. So thank you so much. Thank you for listening and good luck with all of your storytelling and the journals and the memories. Stick around after this. I left a little blooper once again on this episode. And if you stay till the end and check out my show notes, I have another treat for you. Thanks for listening. This Nobody's, is the greatest oh show. Man, it's so funny. <laughs> and she remembers all the words. She's so oh, that's awesome. Cute. That's our na- it's like our family anthem right now, all things greatest showman. <laughs> Much to the chagrin of my 14-year-old. He's like, and we blaze saying something else. And I'm like, no, I can't. I physically can't. Every time I start to sing, that's the only thing that comes out. And I'm almost as frustrated as he is. Like, why can't I sing any other songs? I know other songs, but every time I open my mouth, all that comes out is I'm trying to hold my breath. Like, I just can't sing anything else. So I get it. I'm sorry. I, loved, I saw this one meme, you know, it was so funny how it was like everybody was hooked on Frozen and singing Let It Go oh, yeah. forever. And then when Moana came out, it was like, finally a song that's not Let It Go. And it was like, you're welcome. You're welcome. I know. I saw that too. You're welcome. I know. Yeah. Oh, I love that. So yeah, I'll have to post that. My my little you three all yes. the night singing The Million Dreams. It's, it's <laughs> I know. <very> precious. <laughs> It's, it's awesome. So great. <laughs>